good friend and colleague of mine from, from Hamilton College. And um, I'll just go through his, his academic background and tell a, sh a very, very short story of how I got Mike interested in Antarctic work. Um, Mike currently is an associate professor of biology at Hamilton College, but also teaches geomicrobiology for the geoscience students at the college. He got his Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Ohio State, um, his Master's and PhD in Environmental Engineering at University of Michigan, and has been at Hamilton College since 2002, and I was on the search committee that was able to land Mike there at Hamilton, and he is keeping the intellectual lights lit there, and <laughs> I'm very happy about that. Um, so Mike's going to speak to us about uh, pore water and microbes in the Antarctic marine muds and also ickyites and so forth. But um, I want to tell you how I got Mike interested in working in the Antarctic. So in 2005, we had a cruise on the Lawrence M. Gould and we were towing a bottom video camera, the Mud Scud. Some of you may know this beast. And we came, I was looking for drop stones in the bottom of this glacial trough. And instead in the video, we came up with this carpet of white fuzzy stuff. And, being a geologist, I, of course, that knew absolutely, I didn't know anything about what this was. I thought it was fungus. So I wrote to Mike on the email. I said, Mike, we found a carpet fungus. of fungus on the seafloor. <laughs> and I knew Mike could tell me about it. He said, no gene I think that you found was Bigiatoa. Bigiatoa, Big sure. It turns out <laughs> Close we enough. discovered a cold seep, and then I got Mike hooked into going down to find out more about it. But That's right. the ice kept us out of it, and then the sediment from the halving of the icebergs and the collapse of the ice shelf, buried them in it. It's still there waiting to be picked apart. That's right. But that's how I got Mike down south. <laughs> He's going to share with us some really interesting microbial and poor water geochemistry. All right. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Jane. And uh, thanks, everyone, for inviting me. I've had a really pleasant time talking with everybody and just touring your campus. It's beautiful. And so I'm happy to be here, not just because it's snowing at home, so, but it's a <laughs> great contrast. So. Yeah, and that site that Gene uh, emailed me about is still there waiting for us. So at some point we have to make it. <laughs> I won't tell you that story, but we've tried to get there three times, and each time haven't made it. So, so today I'm going to talk about work that I've been doing in the Antarctic. Um, uh, most of the time I'm going to talk about a study we've done on the effect of ice shelf loss uh, on uh, microbial uh, communities uh, in the sediments uh, in the Larsen A embayment. Uh, and then the last part uh, I'm going to talk about a different site, though, for contrast and to talk about... Uh, some of the mechanisms we think may, may be at play at the formation of this really interesting mineral called ickyite. So um, to begin with, uh, just to acknowledge uh, contributors uh, to the data that I'm going to be presenting today, uh, Andrew Sarechik and uh, Liz Bucheri were students of mine who came on the uh, 2012 cruise uh, for which uh, most of the data uh, we have I'll be presenting. Uh, Matthias Cape uh, at uh, Scripps Oceanographic Institute just uh, completed his PhD. Uh, 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 Matthias has done some work on uh, primary productivity in the region we've been working. Megumi Shimizu uh, and uh, Jameson Clark are both at uh, Duke University, and Megumi has been working on lipids. Um, uh, Chung Young Huang is a, a, a scientist at the uh, Korean Polar Research Institute. He was also part of the team uh, during our sampling. Uh, Jason Koval and Dion Antonopoulos are collaborators at Argonne National Lab who have been doing most of the uh, next generation sequencing data that I'll be presenting. Uh, and the, but there were many, many people involved in this. I'd like to say uh, Kara uh, was on the cruise with us in 2012, <coughs> uh, and Jean uh, was the lead PI in putting together the Larissa project in the first place. So. Um, so the LARISA project, uh, the acronym stands for Larsen Ice Shelf System. Uh, the LARISA project was inspired by the 2002 breakup of the Larsen B. I'm sure that you've seen this photograph many times before. And of course, we always like to um, uh, compare these things to various states. And poor uh, Rhode Island uh, gets compared all the time. But uh, so this is the comparison for the, the size of the, the amount of ice that was evacuated during the 2002 breakup. Uh, this uh, project then uh, really uh, put together scientists from uh, many disciplinary uh, groups to try and look at both the uh, ocean uh, ecosystem and ice influences in the peninsula and what's happening during this period of rapid climate change. Um, so a nice little logo. I'm actually not sure who developed the logo for us, Gene. Do you know who did this picture? But the, Julia. Julia did. Okay, so nice, nice graphics here, and you see the similarity inspired by the breakup. Larissa, if you look up uh, in Greek mythology, was a sea nymph who uh, 
I think today's terminology would be hooked up with Poseidon. So I'm not sure if we've, if we've actually, uh, if it's a very honorable name, but nevertheless, we've, we've imbued it with some. Uh, so again, just to say, it's a, it's a large, uh, this is a large multi-PI uh, in, uh, project uh, with representatives in each of these areas. I was one of the four biologists looking at marine ecosystems, and my specific role was to look at the microbiology uh, in these sediments that we studied. So the question we had is uh, to look, uh, that I'll talk about first is what effect does ice shelf loss uh, have on the benthic ecosystem, and specifically uh, pore water geochemistry and the microbial community we see in the, those pore waters. Now, our study, initially our goal was to try and look at the Larsen B embayment, and uh, as I said before, each time we've gone, uh, we've had some difficulty getting back into the Larsen B. So ironically, our plan B was to study the Larsen A. Uh, and so uh, this transect I'm going to discuss is actually a transect across the Larsen A, which has a similar history of ice shelf loss. It just, of, cur- of course, happened earlier, being a little farther north along the peninsula. Uh, So what we see here uh, is a a map showing the extent edge of the ice shelf going back to 1843 is the first record of this. Of course, given the capability of vessels at that time, we're surprised that anybody actually made it south of Snow Hill Hill Island. But uh, we know that the the shelf edge extended at least this far. And then we have a nice chronology here showing that uh, ice shelf retreat until the last major fragment breakup uh, remnant uh, here at the year 2000. So our goal uh, in the study was to try and use spatial location across the historic path of retreat of the Larsen A ice shelf as a proxy for time. And our assumption is that uh, without the ice shelf present, you have new sources of, of phytoplankton productivity that then export a massive amount of carbon and energy to the benthos that wouldn't otherwise be there. So our prediction is that there would be a profound effect Uh, on both uh, pore water chemistry and also the microbial community that we see uh, in these environments. So in order to do this, we set about picking uh, stations. And so this is, this shows the locations of five different uh, benthic stations that we studied uh, during uh, during this transect. Uh, To try to make these comparable, we attempted as as best we could to match these uh, both in water depth uh, the only thing we wanted to have varying was uh, distance from shore and time without ice shelf. Uh, this is a bathymetric map showing uh, the same basin. Uh, you can see that uh, by similar color, we're trying to approximate about the same depth, uh, but it's difficult to do. We were able to match the depth within 250 meters uh, from closest shore to farthest offshore. Uh, now, you might expect, oops, let's back up a little bit, sorry. Uh, you would expect the shallowest sampling site to probably be that closest to shore, but unlike most coastal environments uh, where you have had an ice shelf, we've had excavation of sediments uh, closest to the coastline. So in fact, the deepest site is station one, and we progressively go to shallower sites as we go to station five. If you look at years without ice shelf, we have a nice uh, spread of dates uh, with over 170 years since uh, ice shelf cover at station five, and as recent as only 16 years exposure at station one. So uh, the platform for our study was the Nathaniel B. Palmer, uh, the largest of the two icebreakers that we operate in Antarctica. And the instrument we use for most of the sampling is a megacore. Uh, so megacores were retrieved and brought uh, back into the ship for two primary analyses. We did uh, a semi-microprobe uh, analyses for pH, dissolved oxygen, uh, and reduction potential. Uh, and then other cores were taken into an anaerobic glove box that we set up uh, in one of the uh, freezers on the ship uh, so we could maintain them in ambient or close to ambient uh, conditions. Uh, so I spent my time in Antarctica in a freezer. So uh, I, I have to say I had lots of volunteers to help me once. Uh, so I don't know, <laughs> don't know what the problem was there. Um, But uh, the nice thing about this was that we were able to uh, preserve pore water chemistry uh, and sample it for a variety of parameters that I'll be describing. We also subsampled this then for uh, uh, microbial community composition. And there's a few other analyses that we used uh, from megacores I won't go into at the moment. I'll also add that a few casting cores were also collected for slightly deeper profiles. Okay, so looking at these stations, uh, we, in order to, to say something about shifts in microbial community. 
And you can't simply just take, or you shouldn't simply just take a single core at one location, then move on and take another core at another location, because you have no idea then of how heterogeneous the distribution of microbes is. So in order to try and capture the granularity of this ecosystem, we used a nested uh, uh, multiple scale sampling design. So within each one of our stations, we dropped three megacore racks, and the spacing between the stations was a scale of 20 to 60 kilometers. Between the megacore samplings, the spacings were 200 to 1,000 meters. Then within each megacore rack, we collected three tubes, and the spacing here was between 50 and 80 centimeters. And then uh, in some cases, we actually sampled within a single megacore tube to get spacing uh, ranges of two to three centimeters. So the data I'll be presenting for pore water chemistry and for microbial community is the average of seven to nine megacores at each of the five stations. So <clears throat> looking first at the geochemical trends, um, uh, this shows, uh, for example, changes in pH as a function of, of sediment depth across all five stations. Uh, the dashed line represents the, the mean for our measurements in each. Now, it's very difficult to actually make comparisons visually viewing that. I know for the folks in the back certainly probably can't even read the digits on this. So uh, a more useful way to represent this uh, is as a response surface. So this shows the same data, but I'm plotting here the means uh, as measured for each of our transect stations. So the way to read this uh, is the parameter, measured parameter, uh, is shown in the vertical axis, so pH in this case. Uh, the station number is shown at the end, so this goes across this axis, station one, so close to shore, station five, farthest away. And then this is sediment depth with the surface zero at the end, and then increasing sediment depth in this direction. And so what you observe from this is that there's a general trend for decreasing pH as we go down core at all stations, but that that effect is most profound at station five, where we see the most acidic sediments. So uh, this, we, we interpret this as being consistent with a longer period of organic deposition. That's our supposition in the first place. Without an ice shelf for 170 years, there should be more organic deposition uh, with depth in the cores. And under uh, that period of time, the oxidation of organic matter uh, can uh, decrease the pH. So that's one possible interpretation. But to try and, and uh, determine whether or not that may be an accurate interpretation, it's useful to look at uh, other parameters that we measured. So this is pore water silicate and phosphate. Uh, and what we see in that case is relatively uh, level concentrations uh, for silicate and phosphate, at least comparable, across the transect at the surface. But as we go down core and across the transect, we see high pore water silicate at the bottom of the core at station five and high phosphate. Uh, but at station one, we see the opposite. We see low pore water silicate and low phosphate at station one, and essentially a monotonic increase in both of those as we proceed from station one to station five. So we think collectively this is consistent with a long history of deposition, at least a longer history of deposition of, of particularly diatoms uh, in this region that's, that are providing uh, the silica that can dissolve and form the pore water silicate that we're observing. For those of you who are interested in red field ratios, the proportions across this of silica to phosphate is about 40 to 60, which is a little higher than you expect in diatoms. The classic ratio is 16, but it's within an order of magnitude. So looking at productivity, other measures of productivity across the same transect have been provided by the work that Matthias has done, Matthias Cape. Uh, and what we see here is the modeling work that Matthias did based on satellite imagery uh, collected over the last decade. On the left-hand side, you see sea ice cover. Uh, so high values represent uh, sea ice covering the region entirely. This is station one through five, by the way, one, two, three, four, five. And then these dips are areas of open water. So uh, integrating both open water as well as surface color imagery from satellite imaging. Uh, Matthias fit this to uh, a depth integrated model to provide an estimate of net primary productivity. And what you see on the right hand side here is then, uh, whoops, sorry, keep pushing the wrong button. Uh, his estimates of net primary productivity across the uh, Larsen A embayment. And then the little pins here indicate the positions of the same five stations that we're looking at. So not only does it look like we have a longer history 
of deposition at Station 5, but it also looks like a higher productivity at Station 5. So we expect to see higher amounts of accumulating biomass at Station 5 in comparison to Stations 1, certainly. Another measure uh, recently that uh, Matthias has just completed, uh, and this is uh, as yet unpublished, was an uh, analysis of yo-yo camera images of the bottom where we uh, had evidence of recent phytoplankton uh, deposition. We were there about two weeks after the phytoplankton bloom. So these had just settled to the ocean floor. And you can see uh, what looks like almost, a, uh, in this case, almost a tannish pinkish color here is actually the phytoplankton uh, uh, deposits. So by uh, selectively integrating the appropriate uh, color range here in these images, he was able to uh, do an assessment of 20 to 30 images at each of the stations. And what we get uh, as a result of that is, a, is also this almost monotonic increase uh, in phytoplankton or phytodetritus cover as we move from station one to station five. So collectively, we expect there to be higher deposition and historic deposition of organic at station five. We look next at a uh, down core record of, of uh, chlorophyll A and phao pigments. And indeed, they agree with that interpretation. We see highest concentrations of chlorophyll A and uh, of phao pigments at station five and four. And going down core, actually, uh, it, the interesting thing is at station four, uh, it suggests that uh, at some period earlier in the sedimentary history here, that a location, Station 4, uh, had a higher productivity than Station 5. Uh, anyway, if we look at our only measure of biomass proxy from the data that we collected, uh, that, and that is uh, extractable DNA, we find that uh, it similarly uh, gives us a, uh, the, type, the same profile, that we have high DNA, extractable DNA, at Station 5, um, and lower extractable DNA at Station 1, the lowest with depth as we go uh, down core. So looking at the actual geochemistry uh, of the pore waters, I'm going to focus on uh, nitrogen uh, because this turned out to have the most dramatic trends across the transect. Uh, showing you first actual uh, profiles uh, of the nitrogen chemistry. This is for uh, two cores at each station, uh, uh, station one through five. And uh, in the profiles, you see uh, nitrate in blue, nitrite in red, and ammonium uh, in green. I will point out that we believe there's an artifact near the surface for ammonium. You see these high ammonium concentrations at the surface. Uh, the method we used for pore water extraction was centrifugation. Uh, and we used a, a particularly rigorous centrifugation, probably too rigorous. 10,000 Gs uh, for 10 minutes. And what we now understand is that those conditions can also lead to cell lysis. So we think we're releasing internal uh, cell constituents. So what you're looking at here really is a combined pool of poor water uh, nitrogen chemistry as well as internal constituents. Nevertheless, despite that fact, uh, we can still see the, uh, this trend for high nitrate, particularly at station three near the surface, and relatively high nitrate near the surface for station two. And in terms of the ammonium trends, we see high ammonium down core at stations four and five, an absence of or very low concentrations of ammonium down core for stations two and three, and then again, high ammonium at station one. So if we plot this again as a relief surface, this gives us a, a better overall view of the trends that we're, that we're observing. We see this peak in nitrate at stations two and three, uh, and a depletion of ammonium down core at stations two and three. Uh, now we, we interpret this uh, as uh, a strong sign of nitrification, that is the oxidation of ammonium to nitrate. Now we know that that process involves uh, intermediate of nitrite, and it's a relatively short half-life by comparison. When we look at the nitrite profile, we see very high nitrite at the surface. Again, these nitrite uh, concentrations probably reflect some uh, intracellular nitrite concentrations that would not otherwise have been released. Nevertheless, we, we, we believe this suggests that we have high uh, nitrification rates occurring near the surface and that these are most apparent at stations two, three, and four. And down core, nitrification appears to be most significant at stations two and three. So when we're looking at the microbial community, we're interested in looking for members of that community that might explain these profiles, particularly those that are capable of nitrification. So <clears throat> just a 
Reminder of important pathways uh, in the marine nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen is fixed from the atmosphere uh, by diazotrophs. This uh, organic nitrogen is then uh, made available when these cells die and decompose, usually under anaerobic conditions. We release uh, the nitrogen in the form of ammonia. Uh, in oxygen-rich environments, or in any environment in which oxygen is available, this can undergo uh, aerobic ammonia oxidation, forming nitrite, as I discussed, and then eventually nitrate. Under anaerobic conditions, or anoxic conditions, nitrate can serve as an electron acceptor, uh, leading to the process of denitrification, again forming nitrite, then eventually nitric and nitrous oxide, and eventually diatomic nitrogen again. So these three being gases uh, are the main route by which fixed nitrogen is returned to the atmosphere. I'll point out that under anaerobic conditions, there's an alternative pathway uh, to remove uh, ammonia, uh, or to oxidize ammonia, and this is now the anamox, anaerobic uh, ammonia oxidation process. Uh, this <clears throat> also results in the formation of diatomic nitrogen and is also a significant pathway by which we return fixed nitrogen to the atmosphere. Uh, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to focus on these two groups, the uh, uh, nitrifiers, um, uh, aerobic ammonia oxidizers, and then also the microorganisms we think are responsible for anamox because they correlate well with the pore water geochemistry that we've uh, just been looking at. Okay, so for our microbial community analyses, a couple of approaches we took. We, uh, most of our work has uh, employed next generation sequencing. So uh, <coughs> next generation sequencing simply is, a, is a, one of a collection of methods that allow us to sequence more deeply into community samples than we have previously. The platform we use is one called the Illumina uh, MySeq platform. Uh, on average, we're able to get about 15,000 reads per sample. Uh, given all of uh, the 40, in total, 47 uh, megacores that we collected in the transect, we had close to 700 samples in total. Those specifically at these stations, a total of about 600. So 15,000 reads apiece, we had about 10 million reads uh, total uh, for characterizing the microbial community. Um, now, that's a lot of data, uh, so you can't analyze those sequences individually. And so what we've been using is a pipeline called CHIME uh, for processing those. Uh, they help identify <coughs> uh, closest related organisms and then to uh, an assign a, a, an identity to them based on an agreed-upon taxonomy. Uh, and the one that we use is one called the Green Genes Taxonomy. Uh, so what can you do with all of that sequence data? Among other things, you can take a look at diversity metrics. Uh, one is alpha diversity. That is, how diverse is the microbial community at any one